12th of December. Help me tell your neighbor, 12th of December. We are trusting God to do a groundbreaking uh, ceremony and begin the long-awaited uh, journey to build for our children. And so that's the reason why we have a fundraiser today. And so we will uh, have that moment uh, to uh, give to the Lord, even as we uh, do the fundraiser. And so uh, for that reason, uh, I will take, uh, I've decided to take this day because I realize also that uh, I haven't done this most, I think probably the whole of this year, but I will take opportunity this day to share something about giving uh, so that we have clarity, we have understanding, because giving is not just happening because of our project, but giving is a practice, uh, a, a Christian practice. And so I want to take, spend some few minutes today and just share some thoughts from scripture about why we give, uh, what we give, when we give, and how we should give. So that's what we're going to be talking about in a nutshell uh, in, in a few minutes, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, draw some principles from Scripture that can help us with giving. Amen? You ready? Today is Pastor Rasta's birthday. Yeah? Happy birthday. Yeah, just remember that. Happy birthday, uh, Pastor Erastas. So, Mumuambi, happy birthday. And, uh, oh, okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Erastas. Happy birthday to you. Hi. That is someone who knows how to celebrate. <laughs> uh, we need to celebrate every moment of our lives. Amen? Uh, so, Musalamieni ile salamu siya jenzi. Yo salamu ingine. Ya kusema happy? Aya. All right. Second Corinthians. I will read Second Corinthians chapter. Second uh, Corinthians. Chapter 8. Uh, where are my notes? Second Corinthians chapter 8. Um, we are going to read a few verses there. And then we will continue as we go on to read a few other uh, verses in Scripture. But let me just first come here for, I mean, just read this and then we can be able to look at what God is saying. So this week I felt, uh, on Wednesday I started talking about the culture of generosity or the spirit of generosity as part of the kingdom culture uh, that we have. Uh, and today, being a day we are also giving, I thought it's important for us to share something that will help you uh, to appreciate why we give and then into your life and as you go on into your future you will embrace the principles that we are learning today uh, about giving um, okay so second corinthians chapter 8 from verse 1 the bible says moreover brethren we make known to you the grace of god bestowed on the churches of macedonia that in a great trial of affliction and the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, mm -hmm, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Uh, so the passage that we are reading, uh, the context, let me build the context and then we can pick it up. The context of this passage is that 
the Apostle Paul had begun an initiative, a fundraising initiative, uh, to fundraise or to raise funds for the church in or the saints in Jerusalem. It appears that the saints in Jerusalem uh, were going through a rough time and a difficult time, and they needed help. Now, I want you to understand that the church began in Jerusalem, and now from Jerusalem, through persecution, scattered into the other places. Paul came later in the day, and Paul planted churches in different parts of Asia, and so Paul is going to the churches that he has planted, and he is raising funds to support the church in Jerusalem and to support the saints in Jerusalem. And so this was something going on in several churches uh, where Paul had made the appeal. Now, when Paul is coming to the church at Corinth, he is coming to them with the same appeal and uh, he's appealing to them concerning that giving. But then, this is something that wasn't new. They were aware about it, and they had begun to raise funds for the church in Jerusalem one year before. So they have been raising funds. And then now Paul writes a letter to them. I don't know why Paul wrote this specific, uh, you know, encouragement to them. Uh, this specific encouragement. I know the reason he wrote the letter, the second letter uh, of uh, Corinth to the church of Corinth was because he, they had come from a very, uh, I mean, he had rebuked them harshly in the first letter to the church in Corinth because of the many problems that church was going through. And so the second letter was more of an encouraging letter, was more of, uh, you know, uh, after the rebuke, now comes the healing, the encouragement, the order, the instructions. And so now he's speaking to this church, and he's telling them, uh, using the example of the church in Macedonia, among the churches that he, had, uh, he was raising funds from. But what is curious about the church in Macedonia is that it appears, I'm using that phrase carefully, it appears that Paul did not ask the church in Macedonia to be part of the fundraising initiative. And the reason for that was that Paul probably thought because of what they were going through, let me not burden them with the fundraising initiative. Why? This church was going through great affliction. This church seemed to be uh, in deep poverty. So meaning they didn't have resource. They didn't have means. And so Paul felt like excusing this church from participating in the initiative of giving. Uh, that's my hypothesis based on what I'm reading in the scripture. So, and this is why I'm saying that. He says, moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Uh -huh. That in great trial of affliction and the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Now, this is the verse. Uh, is it? No, verse, verse uh, go to verse 4 or 5. 4. Yeah, so in verse 4, this church were pleading with Paul. Praise the Lord. They implored us with much urgency that we should receive the gift of the, and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. So they are pleading with Paul to receive from them their gift, their giving for this initiative Paul has for the church in Jerusalem. So they are pleading with Paul. And that's why I'm capturing this idea that Paul 
was feeling like I don't want to burden them. You get? And so they were like, no, we want to be part of this thing. We want to participate in this thing. And so, um, so Paul now sends Titus. I think verse 6 talks about how Paul sent Titus to them. Uh, I'm sorry, not Titus to them. Uh, Paul is sending Titus to the church in Corinth. So now, Paul is using their example, the church in Macedonia, to tell the church in Corinth to ex excel in the grace that is in the churches of Macedonia. Are we together up to that point? So Paul is encouraging the Corinthian church that as I am sending Titus to you, I'm giving you an example of one of your brethren or sister churches that are excelling in the grace of giving. Learn from them. They are giving us a pattern and a model we can learn from. Are we together? So what is there to learn from this church? So we go back to uh, verse 2 as we build on this. This is what we see in this church. That in great trial of affliction, they were in affliction, they were going through stuff, but in the same breath, they were happy to give and to participate in this initiative. So in the abundance of their joy, meaning that they were not pushed, they were not forced, they were happy to participate. They were excited to be part of this initiative despite their affliction. Number two, these guys had deep poverty. That means that resources were scarce amongst them. They, they didn't have the wherewithal. They didn't have the means. They didn't have the resources. But yet, they still wanted to participate. Praise the Lord. And the riches of their liberality. Now, that means they had a spirit of generosity. That it's amazing how a church in affliction and a church that is experiencing lack can be generous and liberal in their giving. Ideally, the mindset is when I am in lack, I should be the one receiving. I shouldn't be the one giving. So I wait to receive. I walk with a begging bowl because I am the one in need. But this church changes that mindset. And this church is all out giving, I mean going out of their way to give even in their lack and even in their trials and even in their challenges. They are going out of their way to give. How do I know that? The next verse tells you. The verse 2 tells you their condition and their state, their attitude and their state. But verse 3 goes ahead to tell you, to tell you what they did despite their physical condition. And so verse 3 says, For I bear witness. In other words, this is something I saw, I experienced, that these guys, according to their ability, and yes, beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Praise the Lord. And they were pleading with us to allow us to participate so that they, we can receive what they have raised for the saints and the church in Jerusalem. Now, it goes on to the next verse, and it says in verse 3, it says they were willing, uh, you know, and... Sorry, not verse, uh, where did they, I'm looking for, okay, verse 5, verse 5. And this is the pattern. It says, and not only as we had hoped. So these guys, you know, gave according to their ability, but beyond their ability. But this is the thing that imp uh, impressed Paul and impacted Paul. He said, as we were thinking, they just want us to, to give. I mean, to, to, they wanted to participate in giving. But when we came, we realized something. These guys had a different mindset. It says, not as we had hoped, but first 
they gave themselves to the Lord. And then to us by the will of God. And, and I said, let me come here for a few minutes so that we can appreciate giving. In the context of a sent community and in the context of the kingdom of God, it's important for us to understand some principles when it comes to giving. On Wednesday, and I'm going to continue to talk about that on Wednesday today, I'm just saying that it's important for us to understand uh, why we give and, you know, all those other dimensions of giving. Now, let me, let me go back to this verse. It says, they first gave themselves to the Lord, then to us by the will of God. If we are going to flow in the grace of giving, if we are going to excel in the grace of giving, we must understand some two perspectives very importantly, and that's what these guys understood. It says they first they gave themselves to the Lord. They understood. The Lord means owner. They understood who is the owner of all things. Giving will remain a struggle for any believer if you don't understand who is the owner, who is Lord, who is in charge. That's the first principle. If you're going to be a giver, it must begin there. Who is in charge? And there is two perspectives that I need you to appreciate for you to be a giver, for you to practice the grace of giving, for you to have a spirit of generosity, for you to be rich in your liberality. These two principles are very key. Number one, the principle of ownership. Number two, the principle of stewardship. So those two things, the principle of ownership and the principle of stewardship. Number one, the principle of ownership. God owns all things. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Psalms 24. And all who belong in it, they are the Lord's. God is the owner. God is the landlord of the earth. So the earth is the Lord's. And all its fullness. So you can imagine what fullness means. Everything that is in it. So the earth is the Lord and all its fullness. The world and those who dwell in it, including the people who dwell in it. Everything is the Lord's. The Lord is the owner. The Bible tells us silver and gold belong to God. So meaning that even the money on the earth belongs to God. Silver and gold belongs to God. Psalms 50, I think. Uh, that's Haggai chapter 2 and verse 8. So Psalms 50 uh, tells us, a kettle in a thousand hills belong to him. And, and kettle in scripture is a picture of wealth, you know. And so it means that, you know, for every beast of the forest is mine. And the kettle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. So God is saying, all the resources of the earth belong to him. So he's the owner. Now, if God is the owner, then you can't be the owner. You can only be who? A steward. So that's one principle. God is the owner. We are stewards. So it's important that you understand. God is the owner and I am a steward. So if God is the owner, it means therefore that all that I have belongs to God. He owns it all. He owns it all. Everything that I have belongs to him. John chapter 3 and verse 27. Um... John the Baptist says something very profound that we all need to take to heart. He says, can we read that together, by the way? Two, three. All right. Can we do it again with some oomph? A man? All right. 
ask your neighbor, what do you have? Have you received anything? It means it came from? No, they may not be convinced, so we need to convince them. James chapter 1 and verse 17. We are trying to convince you that everything you have comes from God. Sour. So James 1, 17, what does it say? Uh, let's read it now with some strength, like, you know, excited. Eh? Let's go. And, and, uh huh. So every good and every perfect gift comes from where? So we are saying the source of all good things is from? He's the owner of everything. We still need to convince you. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Now, if everything is coming from God, now this is what Paul is asking. Can we read it together? Read it like it has a question mark. So you're asking the question. So let's go. For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have? Now, if... Why do you boast as if you had not? Can you read that to your neighbor now? It sounds like your neighbor needs to hear it. So let's go ahead. Two, three. And what do you have that you did not? And if... That's on a ring, Nini. Na ile okonayo ulifanya nini? Because God is the owner of all. So because God is the owner, we have established that. So who are you? Talk to me, who are you? Now let me tell you who a steward is. A steward is someone who manages something on behalf of another. So a steward is not the owner. A steward is a manager who manages what doesn't belong to him. It belongs to another. So we have now established the owner is God. So that means I am a... So whatever I have, I am a steward. Whatever God has entrusted me with belongs to him and I'm merely a, a steward to manage it on behalf of God. So the wealth, the gift, the skills, the resources, whatever it is that I have, I am managing it on behalf of the owner. Who is the owner? Talk to me. Who is the owner? And who am I? A steward. They don't belong to me. That's why, you know, uh, you should stop struggling with 10%. Why? Because God owns 100%. He doesn't own 10%. That's a wrong theology. God owns? All that you have belongs to? You are only a? So if God asks you for 10, he is only asking what he has given. Because if God didn't allow you to get it, you wouldn't have it. Are we together? So that's why that debate about tithe is immature. You should grow up and appreciate that all that I have and understand, all that I have belongs to, to God. And I am a steward. Now, if I am a steward, then what is required of me? First Corinthians chapter 4. Is it first or second? First Corinthians 4, 2. Check first or second. First Corinthians 4, 2. Yes, 4, 2. What does it say? Let's go on. Read together. We are reading together. First Corinthians 4, 2. Moreover, that one be found? The number one requirement of any steward is to be what? Faithful. That's the requirement. God doesn't require anything else of you. He requires you to be faithful. The parable of the talents, the parable of the miners, where the master gave uh, talents and gave resources, money to these people. When he came back, 
he judged them based on their faithfulness on what they did with what he gave. Because God requires faithfulness. God did not judge them based on their output. God judged them based on their faithfulness. Because what God requires of us is what? Faithfulness. You may have little. One had one. Another one had five. They were judged the same because the judgment was based on faithfulness. Because that's the requirement of a steward. Be faithful with what God has given you. Be faithful with what God has given you. And now, faithfulness means I am loyal, I am trustworthy to handle what God has given me on his behalf, to do what he intended me, to do with what he has given me on his behalf. That's what faithfulness is about. Praise the Lord. Now, God, who is the owner, has a reason why he gives us what he gives us. And his reason is, goes beyond you and me. Kingdom agenda is God's paramount agenda on the earth. And whatever God does on the earth, in our lives, has kingdom agenda as the main thing. And what is this kingdom agenda? Reconciling man back to himself. That's his kingdom agenda. The bottom line, in summary, in a nutshell, kingdom agenda is about reconciling man back to himself. And so God is consumed with his agenda. God is devoted to his agenda. God is given to his agenda. So the work of the Lord is geared towards the agenda he has, which is to reconcile man back to himself. That's the work of God. And so whatever God does in our lives has that agenda. So Esther is told, who knows that you are in the kingdom for such a time as this? What God is saying to Esther is this, I did not raise you up to become the person you have become in a foreign land to achieve an impossible feat in a foreign land because I just wanted you to glow and bask in the glory of being the queen. There is a reason why I raised you. There is a reason why I gave you that platform. There is a reason why I released those resources into your hands. There is a reason why I gifted you with what I gifted you with. There is a reason. I have an agenda. Praise the Lord. And so, as a faithful steward, I need to understand the why God is doing what he is doing in my life so that I can manage this thing that God has given me in the way he intended it to be used. Are we together? So it's important. Who knows that you're in the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows that God has blessed you the way he has? for such a time as this? Who knows that God has resourced you the way he has for such a time as this? Who knows that God has opened the door for you the way he has for such a time as this? It's always important to ask yourself, why is God doing what he's doing in my life? How come I am the one with this opportunity. I am the one with this resource. I am the one God has given this idea. I am the one God has opened this door for. How come it is me and not another? Because God has an agenda. And we need to understand that. So having set that stage, it's important for you to understand, like I have talked about this before, when we talked about the characteristic of a kingdom person. It's important for us to understand that giving is not just about agenda. Giving is a nature of a kingdom and a godly person. It's not just about an agenda. It's a nature. I've set up the stage for the agenda for you to understand that whatever God is, does in our lives is because he has an agenda. And for us, God is the owner. We are stewards. And the two attitudes we need to have, you know, apart from understanding that God is the owner, the two attitudes we need to have is that of stewardship, it doesn't belong to me, it belongs to him, and that of contentment. Contentment means that I 
have, and I have given up the right to determine what I should have and shouldn't have, and I allow God to be the one in charge of what he gives me. You've never thought contentment from that perspective. You thought contentment is to be satisfied with what you have. But it's important for you to understand contentment is to be satisfied with what God gives you. Are you together with me? It is God is the owner. Every good and perfect gift comes from him and he's the giver of men. And so me being content means if God has chosen it fit for me not to have it, now I am content. That's what it means. Con contentment is not saying the day I drive a Mercedes, I will be content. No, because the day you drive a Mercedes, you will discover the one you have is inferior to the one you saw on the road. Then you will begin to want a Maybach because a Mercedes is no longer luxurious. Are you getting the picture? So you will not be content because there is always going to be something. If you are the one who determines what is enough, you will never be content. I can prophesy to you with my eyes open. You will not be content. Because you will always see something better. And you will want something better. When you determine what is enough, you will fall into the trap of comparison. And that trap of comparison will lead you to covetousness. And covetousness will lead you to competition. And competition will lead you to compromise. And compromise will destroy your character. Did you hear what I said? Comparison will lead to what? Covetousness. You will begin to covet what somebody else has. When you covet what they have, when you covet their, where they are, what they have, the progress they have made, you will fall into the temptation of competition. I want to be better than them. So they become the standard you want to beat. So you get into competition. Competition will lead you to compromise. You will take shortcuts because you want to get ahead by all means necessary. So you will take shortcuts. You will do things that are wrong. You will become corrupt because you want to get ahead. And that messes up your character. And that's why instead of comparison, function with, a, 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 with an attitude of contentment. Never compare yourself with another. Be content with what God has given. Grow into it. Don't go into it. Allow God to take you to the next level. Allow God to give you what he gives you. Ask anything in my name and he shall give it to you. What is God telling you? He's telling you, don't look at your neighbor. Look up. Look to me and pray. And if I give it to you, be content with what I've given you. If I don't give it to you, you don't need it now. Wait until I give it to you. You don't need it now. Okay, now let's go into the next thing. So that's the two attitudes. So now we have understood that God is the owner. We are stewards. We need to be content with what God has given to us. Now, we have understood God has an agenda and whatever he has given to us is not for us. It's because of his agenda. Now, the thing now we need to understand is, which I'm finishing with, is the practice and the culture of giving. So we have understood why we give is because God has an agenda. Why we give, it's because it's the nature of a redeemed, regenerated man. When they got born again, the first sign of physical or practical sign of their salvation was that they did not consider what they had as their own. Meaning that they were willing to release what they have because that's the nature of a kingdom person, a Christ-like person, a godly person. We are givers by nature because God is a giver. For God so loved that he gave. Praise the Lord. 
You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. You can give without loving. You can give with strings attached. You can give motivated with self-interest. And a lot of giving that is happening today and a lot of preaching on giving that is happening today has self-interest attached to it. But giving, you can give without love. There are many people. And that's why when Jesus came to the temple, the Bible says he took the whip and chased everybody in the temple. Do you know why? Because they, although they were giving, they were giving with selfish reasons. So who did he chase? He chased the people who were selling and the people who are buying, all of them were chased. So when you accuse the preachers who are taking money from people and enriching themselves, you also need in the same breath to accuse those who are giving that money to those preachers with selfish motives. Because why do you give? Because I have told you when you give, you will get. Are you getting the picture? You are also a businessman. Because we give because it's a nature of God. We give because we love God. We give because we are motivated by God. We give because we understand kingdom agenda. That's why we give. So how do we give? How do we give? Second Corinthians chapter 9. How do we give? From actually starting from uh, the first Second Corinthians 8, the Bible says about this church, uh, if I start from them, it says this is how they, they gave. They gave themselves first to the Lord. They submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. And then they gave to the apostles. But then the Bible says they gave, they were freely willing. So the number one quality of giving is a willing heart. God does not receive anything from somebody giving out um, grudgingly or coerced. That's not giving that goes to God. If you give because I coerced you to give, I can guarantee you today that you have released, but that's it. It doesn't attract God's blessing. It doesn't attract God's uh, God is not pleased by that kind of giving. Praise the Lord. God is not at, uh, pleased by... Giving must be willing from a willing heart. And willing means I want to give. I have not been forced to give. I have not been uh, cornered to give. I have not been manipulated to give. I want to give. That's how giving should happen in the house of God. And that's why in church, we cannot manipulate people to give. We cannot whip your emotions to give. No, it's supposed to be from a willing heart. Every time you hear giving in this church, it has to come from a willing heart. If you don't have that willingness, please do not give. Because I can tell you as the pastor here, that giving doesn't attract any blessing from God. Because it's not from a willing heart. I will take the money, but you will not be blessed. Because it's not from a willing. But when you give from a willing heart, then you allow God to release resources into your hands. Why? Because God can trust you as a steward to use what he has given to you to accomplish his agenda. And that's you're going to see that in, in a moment in Scripture. So 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we are going to see how in a moment and then we are done, then we go into our project initiative. Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it's superfluous for me to write to you. Remember, he's just talked to them about the Macedonian church. So now he continues. For I know your willingness. Now he's talking to the Corinthian. He has left the example he gave them. Now he's telling them, I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the church in Macedonia. So God, interesting. Paul talked to the church in Macedonia about the Corinthian church. Paul talks to the Corinthian church about the Macedonian church. And now he says that Achai was ready a year ago and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Uh -huh. Yet I have sent the brethren lest 
our boasting of you should not be in vain. Uh, in this respect, that as I said, you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we not to mention you should be ashamed of this confident boasting. In other words, if I come with guys from Macedonia after I have boasted about you to them, and then we reach and they realize you guys were not even ready. You are doing it as an afterthought, not as something that you have purposefully prepared yourselves for. So he says, get ready before I come. Are you getting it? So now he says, therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand. Now, does that look like a giving that was accidental? There was a revelation Paul had, sipped some tea, prophesied so that you guys can give? No. What did Paul do? Paul prepared them beforehand. He was coming to receive money. Are we together? He was coming to do what? There was fundraising going on for a year. So if you think we are doing the wrong thing to fundraise, look at scripture. There was fundraising going on for a whole year. And Paul now is coming to receive that money. And before he arrives to receive money, he even sends people ahead and says, let, before I come, <laughs> I am sending someone ahead so that you guys are organized, so that when I come, I find you ready. Praise the Lord. And then he says what? He says, and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you have previously promised. So it wasn't something you are coerced, manipulated. You promised that it may be ready as a matter of? Talk to me, as a matter of? Because that's the spirit of giving. It's a spirit of generosity. Be ready as a matter of generosity, not as a grudging obligation. That's not how we give. It should not be an obligation. It should be something that we are willing to do and we are ready to do. We, are, we have a spirit of generosity. That means a willingness to give. And it's not determined by what we have. We have seen that in the church of Corinth, I mean Macedonia. They were not giving because they had. They were giving because they had the grace of giving, the spirit of generosity. And I have seen people, by the way, when somebody has a spirit of generosity, even in their poverty, they give. I have gone to places where you go, especially in, in the villages, you go to places and, you know, this show, show will go and get the only chicken left in the compound. Get it so that they can make sure they give me something to go with. And I'm like, I'm the one who should be giving. But this lady is going to get what is left to give. What is happening here? It's not because I asked for it. It's because they have a heart to give. Praise the Lord. And you know, uh, us, we are very happy when we go. We go and we take. And we never? It's a crime. Uende kwa mtu ambaye anaitaji, kwa roa yake ya generosity akupatie, na we uchukue na uishie. No, that's a crime. You need to reciprocate with the heart of generosity. You're not paying back, but you need to have the same heart. Are we together? So go on to the next verse. So this is the instruction now. I think it's uh, verse. But he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So there is a reward to your giving. And it's only God who determines that reward. But now at least this is where I'm coming to. Verse 7. It says, so let each one. Now, help me tell your neighbor. It says each one. And that includes you. Now, listen. The Bible did not say, let, so let the rich. Does it say that? 
Can you read that again with me? Does it say, let the rich? What does it say? Let. So each one has an obligation to give. I mean, as a call to give. Each one. Let each one give as he has done what? Purposed in his. So willingly and then purposefully. Meaning, I planned and intended to give. That's what it means. Each one needs to plan their giving. Each one needs to deliberately think about what they should give. That's purposeful. In their heart. Not because I have told you give 10,000, give 20, give one. No. You give according to what you have purposed to give. So what have you purposed to give? That's how we should give. That means when you come to church, you don't come and remember giving when the offering time comes. Oh, it's offering time. So you look for what is available to give. No, that's not giving. Giving is before I left home, I knew I'm going to church. I plan to give. So I determine what I should give. I package it and then I bring it to God. Are we together? That's what purposeful means. Giving also from the word purposeful is also very personal. Giving is personal. Very personal. Listen to me and listen carefully. If God has put a burden in your heart to do something, don't ask for other people's opinion. It is God who has put it in your heart. If you come to me, I may think what you are giving is not important. I may ask you, why are you giving? There are people who can do that. Are you getting the picture? But God spoke to you. Then you sought an opinion. You know, it reminds me of the young prophet and the old prophet. God sends him, and then the guy goes and asks an opinion. And what happened? It ended in disaster. Because the instruction was personal. When God asks you to do something, do it. That's why, as a pastor, by the way, if somebody comes to me and tells me, I have a burden, God has told me, or God has laid this in me, I want to do this or that, I never stop them. I never redirect them. We have a great project that is going on. We want to raise funds for that. But if somebody comes and tells me, I want to buy this speaker for the church, I will not stop them. Because I don't know what God has been doing in their hearts. God has put that burden in their hearts. I will allow them to give to what God has led them to give. Because God knows there is a building project, but God told them about the speaker. Are you together with me? Because giving is personal. Help me tell your neighbor, giving is personal. So it's not, don't, don't go looking for opinion. What should I give? The only place you consult is with your spouse. What should we? Because you are one. But you don't go outside your spouse to consult. No. You give what God has told you to give. And it's not, if you come to me and consult me, I don't know what God told you. The only consultation you can have is based on your burden, you can ask, come and ask me, what is the budget for? I will give you that one. That one I have in my office. Anything we need here, I know. And if you come, I'm ready for you. I will give it to you. Are you getting me? But you hear God for you? So purpose in your heart. Not grudgingly and of necessity. Then finally, for God loves? I want to stop there. God loves a cheerful giver. That even in my need, as I give, I am giving joyfully to God. Meaning... I want to give. I delight in my giving. I am not giving, you know, uh, should I give, should I not? Uh, what will I do? Uh, no, no, no. I'm giving joyfully. I want to give. I'm glad to give. I am privileged to give. It's an opportunity to give. I'm giving joyfully because I'm participating in kingdom agenda. Amen? Amen. So, as we finalize, we have a building project. So this is 
I've finished with the sermon. I'm going into the project. We have a building project that has been running the whole year, the whole first two years, actually, that we've been raising funds for. God gave us this dream, this, heart, this thought, that we should build a place for our children. It's God who gave it to us. Is that a good cause? Yes, it is. Is it for kingdom purpose? Yes, it is. Because we are creating a place for our children to worship. And I don't need a revelation to know the children need a place. I just need to go to the children's church. And when I go there, I see the chaos in that place, and I will know I need to do something. Now, if you need to be moved by something else, something is wrong. You do hear me? Yani, watoto wako, wanaenda kwa Sunday school, wanasoma, uyu mwalimu wanaongea, na ule mwalimu mwingine wanaongea, na wanasikia, meseju nasikia ya kule ama ya huku. You see that confusion that is going on there, and, and you still need to hear God? My friend, you don't need to hear God. You just need to ask yourself, how can I participate in making this environment better for our children? Are we together? So, and don't sit there and say, kuna wadosi hapo, haundo watafanya. Mimi, you know, time yangu ikifika nitafa? No, 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 no. That's why I was very glad when Pastor Joseph involved our children in giving. I was very happy. Why? Because, you know, and, and those young kids were very excited. And they were going to their parents and going to their friends. And they were raising money to give excitedly because they know they are building a place for themselves. Because anyone can participate in giving anyone and you can give what you have in terms of finances you can give resources you can give in kind you can whatever it is expertise all that is still giving so you are not without something to give you are not excused from giving you are not forced to give but from a kingdom perspective let each one, God has included you in the each one. All of us can participate in giving. Amen. So whether you pledged or you didn't pledge, you can participate in giving because you are giving to kingdom agenda. You understand this is God's work. God's heartbeat is about his work. Amen. Tumelewana? So this project, tumekuwa nayo, tutaendelea kuwa nayo. And God will build that thing through us. The question is, can God trust you with resources? Because God knows, if I open that door, if that brother gets that business, if that sister gets that job, my work will be advanced. God can trust you with resources. I want to be among those that God can trust with resources. And so I will do what I can as God enables me to participate in what God is doing in his house, in this church. And so I'm calling on you to partner with this church in the course of your giving. Amen. But it's important for us to embrace that attitude that we have learned from the word of God. So I want to hand over the mic uh, to the leaders of the service to wind it up and then quickly, immediately transition to giving. So stay uh, for this time because this is a special day. It's going to not take too long, but stay so that we can be part of what God is doing with us in this place. That building will be built because God has put that burden in our hearts. We are not going to walk with begging balls and entitlement. We are the ones God is trusting to do this work. Amen? God bless you.